Good evening and welcome to the My Choices broadcast. This session will last for around 60 minutes and will include a presentation followed by a fantastic panel discussion and Q&A. This session will focus on the different pathways into employment and offer you the chance to learn more about the new plan for work opportunities in the area. Questions for today's speakers can be submitted via the Q&A function on the right hand side of your screen and this will be open throughout the session. I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker, speaker, Paul Thompson, Education and Skills Manager with SEMLAP. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Carly, and welcome everybody. So this particular presentation is uh, looking at the different pathways to a career and the opportunities within the area. Um, SEMLEP uh, is basically responsible for supporting the economic development in the area, and the area being Northamptonshire, Bedfordshire, Luton and Milton Keynes. Uh, and um, it's a question of listening to employers and then actually understanding their needs and making sure that people actually understand of the opportunities within the area and what skills are required. And I say that we listen to employers and we, we do this through several different methods. Uh, we, we refer to this um, in yesterday's broadcast. So through business engagement groups, um, consultation, which results in the re reports that you see listed there, uh, biannual business surveys, and we constantly monitor job vacancy data uh, on, a, on a weekly basis. So the education landscape is quite vast. Uh, I don't, probably it's, it's probably the most largest it's ever been, I think, with the different options that you've actually got out there. Um, and there's a number of different pathways you can actually take. When we start with the kind of more traditional academic routes, uh, most people will be aware of these, so GCSEs, A-levels, uh, baccalaureates, that kind of thing. Then we have the more technical and vocational qualifications, probably more related specifically to, to an occupation. Um, and this will include the new T levels, um, which are coming through um, next year in this particular area. We have higher education, uh, which primarily is study at university, but it can also include study at college um, or online. Apprenticeships. Um, quite a unique way of studying, so you learn whilst you earn, 20% uh, uh, away from work actually learning as well, lots of different levels, um, so entry level, level two right the way through to level seven, level six, so degree level. Um, and then there are a whole range of kind of programmes to assist people into employment, um, such as traineeships and study programmes. And then with COVID-19, we've seen the introduction of the new Kickstart scheme. Um, slightly different in as much as it's actually job placements um, for 16 to 24 year olds um, who have perhaps been on universal credit um, and just need to gain some experience before hopefully employment. The types of provision can be combined in lots and lots of different ways. Um, and there's lots of different pathways that you can actually take. So some people may start off with an academic route and then slip into a technical route. Um, but the important thing here to remember is there is no worse way or better way or right way or wrong way. There is just a way and that's governed really by what the employers are perhaps looking for um, in terms of their kind of pathways into, into a career and obviously what your strengths and your interests are as well uh, and how you're made up and how you learn. Uh, we all learn differently. Um, and there's pathways here uh, for you to ac accommodate that. Um, but they all lead to kind of employment and careers. I mean, the one thing I would say is that, um, um, like myself, if you, you're not too sure what you do want to do, maybe taking uh, a pathway with a kind of broader education spectrum might be a good way uh, to actually kind of look at things. Um, but at every transition level, you should stop and, and take a step back and actually have a look at what the options are and what's, uh, what opportunities are available. The key part of this is kind of research. It's important to understand what kind of pathways and qualifications uh, employers are looking for. And I would always suggest that you actually start by looking at job adverts. Um, even if you're not actually seeking a job at this time, uh, maybe you're in year 10 or something like that, start to have a look at the job adverts around what employers are starting to look for. Um, there's some very good information on the National Career Service website and the Institute for Apprenticeship and Technical Education uh, websites as well. Um, but there are some other fantastic websites um, which can actually help you along the way on this. So things like I Could, uh, Prospects, Job Help, Amazing Apprenticeships. 
there's all kind of places you can actually go and actually look for, for information. And, and particularly these offer kind of summaries of the occupations, qualification requirements. They may even give you some indication of salary ranges as well. Um, very, very handy tools. Um, don't forget though the career support within your own school and your college. There are people there to help you. Um, so please, please, please use them. Um, that's what they're there for. Um, and certainly in my particular case, when I was looking for a job, it, it actually changed my life um, with the advice that I actually got. So well worth um, kind of spending the time. Would also say look for kind of relevant pathways with added value. Uh, so what, what do we mean by that? Well, a, lo a lot of the occupations that we're seeing kind of with big demand against them at the moment are technically or functionally based. Um, so actually kind of gaining some kind of experience along the way really, really helps. The one thing that does come up time and time again, though, is that everybody is looking for good levels of English and maths. Um, they're not exceptional levels, but basic good understanding. Um, so get that sorted whilst you're at school. Get it out of the way. Try your best. If you need help and support, ask for it. Um, we, like I said, we all learn in different ways and we all learn certainly English and maths in different ways. Um, so get as much help as you possibly can whilst you're within education. The other thing I was saying, it's probably equally as important these days as well, is what we call digital literacy. We, we referred to this last in last night's broadcast, but it's fundamentally the use of Microsoft Office and in particular Microsoft Excel and Word and Outlook are the, are the three main ones that come up time and time again. There'll be very few jobs that you will go into these days that will not use the, these elements. Um, so it's important that you can understand them, you can apply them and you can use them. And we'd also suggest that you kind of seek pathways that offer you kind of work experience or work placements or internships. Um, th these will help you provide strong evidence of employability skills when you start to apply for a job. And there are plenty of options out there. So in terms of what's available locally, um, I'm pleased to say that we have some of the kind of best further education in the country and SEMLEP in particular have invested heavily uh, within the facilities. Um, so if we start with Northampton College, um, we have the new digital and construction facilities there actually at the campus in Northampton. They have a nice uh, Daventry campus as well. Uh, Tresham College, uh, big investment has gone into Wellingborough, but the Kettering and Corby sites are fantastic. Uh, they also have facilities at Silverstone as well. Morton College, um, new food and drink innovation centre there, so do with food production. Um, probably one of the few in the country, to be honest with you. They also have fantastic land based facilities as well. By that I mean agriculture, animal care, that kind of thing. Um, Bedford College, uh, brand new advanced engineering centre. Um, very, very good college, one of the best in the country. Uh, has just been recently rated. They too have a land based college at Shuttleworth um, to do with agriculture and animal care and zoology now as well. Um, Barnfield College, we've just announced some new investment there, uh, just over four million pounds uh, for the refurbishment of the new Bedford Road site. Uh, so there'll be brand new facilities there, uh, which will be very exciting, but uh, they offer a whole range of kind of um, options there at the moment as well. Central Beds College, uh, with new advanced engineering centre at Leighton Buzzard, um, but they've also got new construction facilities at Dunstable. And then we have Milton Keynes College. Um, so the facility in Milton Keynes and, uh, and they've just taken on their new students for the new South Central Institute of Technology. Um, so these are new dynamic um, forms of colleges, level four, level five qualifications. Uh, and this one is particularly themed on digital at Bletchley Park. Um, quite special. If we look at higher education, so the universities in the area, we have the University of Northampton. Um, huge investments being made there at the new Waterside campus. Um, it's probably one of the best campus sites certainly I visit um, and it's it's quite special. And similarly at the University of Bedfordshire, brand new science, technology, engineering and mathematics facilities in Luton and they have the campus site as well at Bedford. Uh, there's the University of Buckingham Medical School at uh, Milton Keynes Hospital. And then we have uh, two unique uh, universities in the area. We have the Open University, uh, the largest university in the country, 
Um, there's no students actually on the campus site, which is a bit strange because they teach everything online. Um, and then we have Cranfield University, which is um, a postgraduate university, so a very high level education. Um, forefront of some unique things like low carbon powered flight, driverless vehicles, green technology. Um, so we have some fantastic facilities here with higher education within the area. There's also a whole range of other kind of pathways and facilities as well. Lots of independent training providers um, and you know, they, they provide a whole range of different options and, and pathways and primarily apprenticeships, training ships, maybe some specialist training targeted at uh, individuals, unique things to actually help them kind of get on their way and get on their career path as well. So I'll, I'll close with just a kind of few thoughts. I mean, I would stress the research side, make sure that you fully understand uh, the pathways that employers are looking for. If you have a career of choosing something that you really, really want to do, do, do your research, make sure you understand what the options are, and what the options are to get into that career. Um, remember higher education, there are additional benefits from studying at higher education at university. You know, if you learn away from home, you know, there's lots of kind of personal skills you can learn, the independent side as well. You know, the cost of accommodation yeah, can be a bit prohibitive sometimes. If you've got um, needs on that, there is support available to you, um, but you could learn local. We have the University of Bedfordshire, we have the University of Northampton. It's two good options. Um, and education doesn't finish when you can leave school. It will continue. Um, very few of us have a single career now. Um, I know I'm on my fourth one. Um, it will constantly change and you can ca carry on learning along the way. Um, the Open University is a classic example and most universities and colleges now actually have online learning facilities. And as I said before, there is no golden bullet with this. There is no right, no wrong way, no better way. There is just the way for you. So do your research. You'll be OK. You'll be fine. There's more information on our website at semlap.com, uh, especially if you look at the labour market information pages. And thank you for listening. That's great. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I'm really keen for our audience to hear from our panellists who are fantastic in joining us today. And also, also first off, to learn a little bit about your own career journey um, and how you entered your career and, and I guess the world of work initially. So Anna, perhaps we could start with you and reflect on, on, your, on your career to date. Hi, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, well, I actually was born in Biggleswade in Bedfordshire, so this is a very important uh, event for me to be supporting. I now live in Hitchin in Hertfordshire. Um, the way I got into my career, um, I was one of those young people who didn't, I didn't really want to do A-levels if I'm honest, but I did stay on at school and, and I did my A-levels, but I definitely didn't want to go to university. The thought of carrying on studying full time just really didn't appeal to me. So um, at the time, and it was quite a long time ago, 20 odd years ago, um, I I, I didn't really have any other options made available to me. Um, I kept saying to my school, um, I won't name them, but I kept saying to them, I just want to get some experience. I just want to go out and do work experience and meet employers. And they were kind of saying, no, 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 no. You, you really must go and get a degree. And if you don't, you know, no one will ever take you seriously and, um, and you won't be able to progress your career. You'll never be a manager if you don't get a degree. And there were all those kind of comments. And um, for anyone who knows me, they will realise that um, telling me I can't do something is all the inspiration I need to uh, want to prove them wrong. So um, I actually ended up uh, going to New Zealand, traveling, first time I'd ever flown. Um, and when I came back, I started working in a college as a receptionist. I needed to get some money. There was a job available and um, and then they said, would you like to go for the full time job? So sorry, this is a long story, but basically I worked my way up and through the college um, and then into another position in something called the Learning and Skills Council. Um, they closed and I was presented with a brilliant T-junction moment in my life where I could have gone and got another job or I could set up my own business. So I set up my own business. 
and the main purpose of that is to provide apprenticeship information and awareness to schools and colleges throughout the country. So uh, amazing apprenticeships, we now work with 4,200 schools and colleges. Uh, we do quite a lot of work internationally as well. We work with employers, young people, parents, and it's all about trying to raise awareness of the brilliant options that Paul outlined, apprenticeships, traineeships, T-levels, and anything else we can do to help people. So uh, not a, a traditional route into my kind of job, but yeah, my story. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, and we will definitely be looping back to apprenticeships later in the session. And, and just introducing Julie to our audience now. Julie um, is joining us today. And um, Julie, I'd be really keen on knowing a little bit more about your journey as well. How did, how did you know your career was for you and, and how did that start? On mute. There you go. Um, hi, I didn't have a clue. Can you hear me? Um, you know, I lived in a really tiny mining village in South Wales. My father was a coal miner and all I knew was that I couldn't wait to leave. I couldn't wait to get away from the sheep that were in the back garden. Um, I did my GCSEs, but I didn't stay on to do A-levels because I did a course to become a hotel receptionist. The, the rationale behind that was that I could get a living job as a receptionist, which I did. I found a job working in a hotel in Crick Howell, which is near the Brecon Beacons, and I loved it for a little while. I absolutely did. But um, poor wages and you know, having accommodation was great. But what really, really put me off was the split shift, because when you were living in a hotel, you would work from seven until eleven you'd have the afternoon off and then you'd start work again from 7 to 11 so you didn't really feel as if you had some proper time off so um i left and then i went back to the careers office and they found me a role working as a hairdresser's apprentice now why i don't know i mean i like looking prettier i did when i was young so i thought this would be good um i was absolutely terrible at this absolutely terrible um i was allergic to some of the chemicals that gave me eczema i had no coordination so i almost drowned somebody when i was shampooing them um i you know was i could not hold a scissors and a comb it was just awful but i spent an awful lot of time my my manager knew that i tried my best so she gave me a really good reference and for the remainder of my notice i i helped out on reception so then i'm um, back to the careers office and i applied for two jobs i applied for one to join the civil service but i also applied and got a job working for a criminal lawyer in Caffili, which is where i'm from that when um, i went to law and i did the typing test you know thankfully because of my hotel reception course i flew through that and i got the job now that job was fascinating and we're talking a long long time ago so i you know it was a different age i'd find myself lighting cigarettes for known criminals and murderers and you know i i would see all of the pictures of the crime scene and it was fascinating but the wages weren't amazing. And um, then I was invited for an interview for the civil service in Cardiff. So I was really excited. Um, this was in January. You know, this was a far better wage. And luckily, you know, I had got just enough GCSEs because in those days, you had to have four or five GCSEs, C or above, including English and maths. And I'd scraped that by. Um, so I woke up in the morning and there was about three feet of snow. Um, you know, my little mining village was kind of cut off, but I so wanted this job. So I took a chance and I walked all the way to the train station. Luckily for me, the trains were running. I went along to the interview. I think that they gave me an easy time because I'd made the effort in the snow to get to the interview. So success, I got the job. And a few months later, I started work in the Department of Transport in Cardiff. My first role was um it was something that we don't have now i was i was printing and and people were applying for tax discs so i i stayed there i quite enjoyed that that role and then my husband i got married my husband we moved to northampton so i took time off to have my children and in 1993 i applied to work in the Department of Transport, well, the Department of Health and Social Security, or then it was the Employment Service. It was a six months role. Um, 
I joined. I loved it. They liked me because I'd been, you know, and they at that time you're able to get reinstated. And I've been in there ever since I gained qualifications while I've been in the civil service. So I've improved my uh, my qualifications. I've got promoted two or three times. And the role that I've held for the last four years is a schools advisor and I absolutely adore it. It means going out into the schools and helping them with the skills that I've, I've honed on adults. You know, I've worked with um, when I was a work coach, most of my caseload read like Crime Watch UK. I had lots of people ex-offenders um, and that was fascinating. So I absolutely, you know, I really enjoy this has been the job that I've enjoyed most since COVID struck then I've been using those skills to help adults with employability and things like that. So that's my story. <laughs> OK, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Julian. Great to see that you didn't have every, everything figured out when you were the age of our audience today. And I think that's really important to, to hear. And, and just moving to, to, to Mark, who's joining us this evening as well. Mark, did, did you have a similar journey? Did you know exactly what you wanted to do when you were a teenager? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I mean, I, I grew up on the family farm and the expectation was that you carry on in farming. Um, I did stay on at school to take A-levels um, that would sort of lead to a career in agriculture. Um, but I wasn't really that interested. I had to retake my maths O-level anyway. It's that long time ago, it was O-levels um, because I knew I needed to have maths. So I retook that. I failed my A-levels the first time round because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I then actually decided what I was interested in was environmental science and forestry, estate management and conservation. So I, I then did get a course um, at what was then a polytechnic. So um, when there was a different option between universities and polytechnics. And the night before I was due to start, um, I'd made my mind up that a bit like Anna, I didn't want to stay in education anymore. I'd have enough. I wanted to work. And so I did. I left. I left after the first term. So I dropped out of, as I said, Polytechnic. Um, I got a job in conservation and I trained for five years. Whilst I was working, I became a supervisor and then I became a qualified instructor, um, undertook a load of different qualifications to make sure that I was safe and confident in what I was doing. Um, but then a, an opportunity came up within the organisation that I worked for, and that was to, to move over into more of a developmental role within the company. And so I, I took that opportunity. And from there, I've had successive roles in sort of education and training. And I'm now I'm chief exec of a training company. We work with, with young people at 16 to 18. And typically we work with a lot of young people who are still struggling to find what it is they want to do. So you know, there's no harm in, in not knowing what you want to do. And, and as Paul said earlier, there's lots of different routes uh, and you will change change careers during that time as well. So, you know, I think at the time I was a little bit concerned that I wasn't really sure where I was going or what I was doing and was I just muddling through. But I think things happen for a reason. Um, and I think in hindsight, um, just go with what you feel is right for you and, and things ultimately will work out for you. Fantastic advice. Thank you, Mark. And we just had a question submitted that I'd like to pose to you, if that's OK, uh, from one of our students. And they've asked, do you have any tips for getting work experience, please? <laughs> uh, perseverance, I think, is one thing. Um, absolutely. I mean, if, if you've got, first of all, make use of your own connections that you've got, family, friends, parents of your friends, anything like that, because if you can get personal, personal connections to employers, then that's always very helpful. Failing that, as Paul said, research what employers are around local to you in the things that it is that you're interested to do. Uh, contact them, send them emails, phone them. I would suggest that, um, you know, maybe if you're you're nervous about ringing an employer, have a practice phone call with, with a, a parent or an aunt or somebody within the family who can rehearse things. Um, but it is perseverance because employers are busy. Uh, they don't always um, accept emails or phone calls if they don't know what it's all about. Um, but if you do your research and if you do persevere, a bit like walking for the mining village in all the snow, that shows a determination 
uh, and for, for lots of employers, actually those things are so critical because then they get a measure of that individual and that person think, hang on, this person's determined, they've kept going, they've overcome, you know, the fact that I wouldn't take phone calls or I haven't responded to an email and yet they've persisted. Actually, this this person is, is worth taking a look at now. So pers perseverance. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I shouldn't, shouldn't be much appreciative of that answer, Mark. And and Verity, for those of you who joined us yesterday, Verity is here for her second broadcast this week. So thank you so much for joining us again. Um, as with our previous speakers, it'd really be interesting hearing a little bit more about your journey. I think having the chance to hear from our amazing panellists today on the routes they've taken into their career is so important to see the different avenues that could be open to young people today. Yeah, and I think I'm a great example of what not to do when you're planning your career at the age you are now. Um, so I based my career journey and my education choices on a film I watched when I was 11 called Legally Blonde. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's about a girl who becomes a lawyer um, in America and it just looked like the absolute best job in the world, as things do on telly and in film. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to study GCSE law and A-level law, so the school that I went to offered it, which was great. Really enjoyed the subject and that just cemented that I was going to be Elle Woods and I was going to go and be this hotshot lawyer and save the world. Um, went to university, did a law degree, again massively enjoyed the subject. Um, learning it in theory was, was a lot of fun, really played to my strengths, so there's a lot of problem solving, a lot of kind of getting stuck in the detail and finding the answers, which are all things that I really enjoy. Um, in my third year of uni, I got an internship with a criminal solicitor and I absolutely hated it. So I think what I hadn't appreciated is that when you're a lawyer, you can't choose your clients. You can't always help the innocent people. You quite often have to help the guilty people. Um, and that very much went against all of my morals and kind of what I wanted from a career. Um, so then I was in a bit of a pickle of what on earth do I do now, all of my work experience, all of my qualifications have led me to this point and now I'm not going to go any further with it. Um, I was lucky enough to get a role, um, like an entry level role, it was what we call an operations admin role, so it looks at a wide variety of different areas. There's a little bit of finance, a little bit of human resources, a bit of recruitment. And I was really lucky to get that role and get that experience in such a broad breadth of areas because it allowed me to really identify what I enjoyed and what I didn't. And um, that recruitment piece, that supporting people, bringing them into a business, supporting them on their career was the bit I really enjoyed. So that's when I joined Travis Perkins in a purely recruitment role and um, then ended up going into the apprenticeship and graduate recruitment space. And then I've progressed in that area. So I'm now early careers manager and um, help design our apprenticeship programs, do a lot of school engagement um, and quite strategic level stuff about how we bring young people in and how we attract them. Um, and going back to the reason why I wanted to be a lawyer, which was to help people and support people. I really get that within my role now. So supporting young people on their career journey um, it, it's helping people in a very different way, but it, but it gives me that value add and, and makes me want to get up in the morning and go to work. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Verity. And Rashina, I'd be keen to come to you next. So our audience is aware, Rashina is joining us from the University of Bedfordshire. And to just give us a little bit of insight into your, your career journey so far and, and how did you end up in the, the role you're doing now, Rashina? Hi, hi, everyone. Um, thanks very much for this evening. Um, my role and into this into my pathway is a little bit different. Um, I was the first in my family to go to university. So when I was your age, I actually wanted to be a fashion designer and I was mad into clothes. I was mad into fashion um, and I went off after my A-levels and did a um, art course, so a foundation year in art. And then I decided I was going to go off to university. And believe it or not, back then there was internet was in its infancy and you were given a book and you had to look through the courses for university through a book so you had to go through and sift through the courses have a look at the universities and i decided i was um living in luton i'm from luton and decided i'd move up north so i moved up to preston up to central lancashire um, as I said, I packed my bags, went off and I was basically saying goodbye to my parents, my mates. I thought I'd never be back. I won't be back till the end of the academic year. I got to university and I felt really homesick because it was a completely different to what I expected. But I persevered and I stuck with it. I did my degree over that three year process and I loved the whole university experience. Um, after that, then I went travelling. So I travelled around um, Southeast Asia and then ended up weirdly working in New York for 
a while um, and I was a waitress in a cocktail bar in New York so I know there's a song about that somewhere but that's what I did and I was working there for a long time and decided to come back and when I came back to the UK um, I came back to Luton and a friend of mine got me a job at the university um, and within that role then I kind of thought actually I really like being back in education and I like being back in a setting and um, I progressed then within the university and I've been at the university for 16 years um, working in different roles but my main role is actually in outreach so my role is to support young people to think about going on to university so I don't recruit per se to the University of Bedfordshire I recruit to young people thinking about higher education as an option for them, which is really important distinction. Um, so things that I've done and I do, I do is we run residentials, we run taster sessions, we do GCSE booster classes, um, we help um, underrepresented groups, so we help young people that are from a care background, disabled, um, young carers, and we try to make a big difference in young people's lives. And also we work with parents and tell them about different changes in the higher education system and finances um, and bringing it all together that so everybody has uh, an option to think about higher education in their future and it isn't just at 18 I really really want to put that point that out so um, and a lot of people might come back into education at a different point so we have a lot of our students at our university are actually over 21 our average age is about 27 actually on campus and our oldest student at the moment is in his 70s he's just doing his final year of his degree so thank you that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and last but not least, Tracy, well, please, we're so delighted to welcome you to our session this evening. A again, we'd be really interested in knowing a little bit about your journey because I'm really thinking that you ran your own business, so you have some of an entrepreneurial spirit as well. Yes, um, I, I had, uh, I've, I've had an absolutely brilliant uh, working life. I wouldn't change any of it. Um, I uh, went to a comprehensive school and um, I, the, the subjects I really enjoyed were languages um, and the, um, the intention was to stay on A-levels but I was told I had to do three A-levels. I only wanted to do French and German um, so in the end uh, I decided to go to college and I did a two-year bilingual secretarial course. Um, left, left college at 18, went to work in London, um, had a fantastic early career. I chopped and changed different industries. So I worked in engineering and from engineering, I went into um, international wines and spirits. And from there, I went into fish. Um, from, from fish, I went into banking. Um, and then when I was in banking, I saw this, the person who had a job that was going around um, helping people to use uh, computer equipment. And she spent her day going between the different sites of the bank across London, helping people. I thought, wow, this is amazing. I want to do that. Um, so uh, after some networking, same as, um, same as Mark said, and some persistence, I found myself a job as a trainer in London, teaching people how to use IT systems across um, banking, insurance and the legal profession. Um, and then from there, I went to work for a, um, a software house and was their training manager for a while. And unfortunately, that business um, suffered real financial difficulties in the property crash. And I was left having worked for a month and then not having my pay put into my bank account. And I had a mortgage. Um, and uh, I was in the difficult position that I needed to find some money to, to pay for, pay my way. So I set, started my own business, started working for myself and I grew that business over 20 years. And um, when I, um, 20 years later, uh, a college bought my business and I started working for them, which was actually really good because I had such a brilliant time at college myself. Um, that it enabled me to come back into an environment and I wanted to then help to create a fantastic experience for young people just as I did who left school at 16 and go to college to learn that vocationally. So I've, I've done all sorts of things. I've travelled all over the country, I've travelled out into Europe and I would say that I'm an inquisitive opportunist. So my career has always been going out, seeing what other people do and thinking, oh, that looks really interesting. How do you end up doing that? 
and I've done all sorts of qualifications along the way and as a mature student I also did um, a master's degree um, and, and achieved that when I was in my 40s. So re hugely varied um, and just another person who can prove that I had no idea what I wanted to do. The only thing I knew at um, 16 was that I enjoyed learning languages and that was it. That's fantastic. What an amazing career. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Tracy. And, and now I'm keen to move on to the topic of apprenticeships, if that's OK. So, Anna, I'd love to come to you now. One of our students here has asked about the pros and cons of, of undertaking an apprenticeship. Would you have any insights there at all? Sorry, something weird happening with my screen. I, I'm on two. I hope, hopefully I haven't done anything to break it. Sorry, could you ask that question again? Absolutely. One of our students here has asked about the pros and cons of taking on an apprenticeship. OK, um, well, it will depend on you and your, your personal situation, but I would say some of the pros of doing an apprenticeship are that you will be out in the workplace um, employed in a job so you'll be earning a salary you'll be working alongside experts and um, applying your learning immediately and um, I think this is one of the things I was really craving when I was young I wanted to I still wanted to learn you know I wanted to learn new skills and learn about where I was working but putting it into practice straight away was something that was really important so I think you definitely get to do that through apprenticeships um, I employ apprentices in my business and I try to give them as much exposure to as many brilliant opportunities as possible. So I think that's another pro of being an apprentice that employers really do want to nurture you and your talent and your enthusiasm. Um, my apprentices, I try to bring them to events. I will, you know, when we used to be able to do them face to face, of course, um, I try to get them in on meetings. I try to keep their workload really varied as well. So um, that would be another benefit. Um, you do get to meet other apprentices. So this is sometimes an area that people might be a bit concerned about, kind of, you know, am I going to be giving up on the social life opportunities if I don't go to college full time or if I don't go to university full time, will I still get to meet other young people? Um, and of course you will, you will through your training provider and I'm sure some of the other providers on the call tonight will be able to explain some of that. But um, also there are various networks that are set up that encourage apprentices to meet each other and you know get to know each other and even go out on social activities and events together. Um, some of the cons of apprenticeships or some of the challenges or, or kind of less positive sides, um, you, you need to look around. Like Paul was saying, you know, it's really important that you do your research and that you find an employer who um, will offer a program that's going to work for you. Um, not all programmes are the same. Every employer is different. Every employer will have different entry requirements. Every employer will pay slightly differently. So there is a national apprenticeship salary, a kind of a minimum wage that apprentices must be paid, which is currently £4.15 an hour. Uh, a lot of employers will pay significantly more than that and, and recognise that that minimum wage um, isn't great for a lot of young people, but some employers will still pay that minimum wage. So there's going to be things like that that you need to, to really kind of research and look around. Um, another con on apprenticeships, I would say, is it's competitive. And I think being really realistic about the labour market at the moment, you know, there are going to be more individuals. There are less vacancies. There are still vacancies. And I'm really keen to get that message across tonight. You know, employers are still recruiting and we are seeing apprentices start apprenticeship programmes, but there are less than we would normally be enjoying at this point in the year. So. Um, so that might be another con. And then I think it, another challenge is balancing work and life. So you will be working full time and you will be getting paid time within your um, within your working week. They call it 20 percent off the job learning. Um, now, that's that's brilliant. It won't necessarily be one day a week that you will not be in the workplace, for example. So it's um, it will be worked different ways with different employers and different training providers. But you still will be balancing and juggling 
working full time and learning all of these new skills and gaining your qualifications and getting those experiences. And so it's not the easy option, definitely. Um, but hopefully that kind of gives a, a balanced view on, on apprenticeships. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Anna. And, and, and just moving to, to Verity, if that's OK. Verity, I'm right in thinking that you are responsible um, for some of the uh, apprenticeship programmes with Travis Perkins. And I'd be really interested in knowing your thoughts on how at this point for our audience who are you know, between 14 and 18 years old, how might they know whether an apprenticeship is something they should consider or if it's the right move for them? It, it's, it's a really difficult life decision, like most life decisions are. Um, and I think, you, as with everything, you just need to do as much research as you can. So if you've got an idea about the career journey that you would like to take, start finding out more about those industries, start talking to people that you might know that work in those industries and find out how they got there. It's worth noting that the apprenticeship world has moved on massively within the last three years. There are far more apprenticeships available now than, than there ever have been in lots of different industries against lots and lots of different job roles. So the route that someone had to take to get into that industry 10 years ago will be very different to what it looks like today. So don't just take what they say to you on face value, do a bit of research as well. Um, and I think Paul earlier mentioned the Institute for Apprenticeships website, which is fantastic. Um, that website will tell you every single apprenticeship that is available to you um, against every job role. So the types of job roles that you can move into um, while studying that apprenticeship programme. Um, what the other good thing to do, so if you're thinking of university, write a list of the reasons why it's university. So is it purely because that's the only route into um, that particular career that you want to go into? Or are you really just doing it for the social side and to move away from your parents and have a little, little bit of a different lifestyle? Um, it is it is important that you're aware that you can still do that as an apprentice. Um, so as mentioned earlier, although the apprenticeship minimum wage is only £4.15 an hour, not many employers that I've spoken to pay that much. Um, they pay significantly more. So our apprenticeship schemes, for example, the starting salaries are £18,000. So with that amount of money, you've got plenty of cash there, much more than a student would have to move out, go into a house share, have that university experience, but be working and learning at the same time. So just reiterating, make sure you do your research, think, think about all the different options available to you um, and do keep in mind that as an apprentice, you are getting a paid salary so you can make those different life choices as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Verity. I love that kind of research is really the message of this session so far and really looking into what might be the best fit for you individually. And Rasheen, just moving back to that kind of higher education conversation as well and your work in advising young people as to whether that could be something that there is right for them. What, what are the top tips and advice that you would give to our audience today about higher education? Um, yeah, it goes back to research again. So really good website to look at is UCAS. Um, you'll have loads of different courses. So out there at the moment, there's 38 and a half thousand different degree choices that you have out there in the marketplace um, so you're not limited by your choices so for example if you're interested in um, history for example there's about four and a half thousand different history degrees out there that are available across the sector um, it's also about whether what kind of campus you want to live at do you want to stay close to home so as Paul was saying earlier we've got some really good local universities um, within the region that you can attend um, but if you are thinking about moving away from home would you prefer um, a campus living um, setting or would you like to be in a city? Would you like to be close to um, the coast, for example? And it's also looking at what we call graduate outcomes. So where are the graduates going to once they are actually finished their degree? What kind of professions are they going into? And also what kind of um, incomes are they earning? So um, statistically, you are meant to have a higher um, uh, income achievement with um, a degree than somebody without a degree, but it also does depend on the sector that you go into. Um, and now certain jobs are asking as a minimum requirement is a degree. Um, that's not for all jobs, but it's for certain jobs. So again, you would need to look at what kind of career you're looking at. Um, so to take, for example, nursing, um, there's different routes into nursing. There is the apprenticeship route into nursing, but there's also the degree programme as well. So, you know, looking at a career, you need to look at the different routes that you can go into that. Um, but also thinking about the positive sides of it. University can bring so much as well in terms of independence and social skills and um, your ability to also think of you as an alumni when you leave and all the connections that you'll bring with you when you go back into that sector. 
that's fantastic thank you so much and and Tracy I'm just going to jump to you if that's okay and just thinking about your your current role and the work experience element that comes into that um, do you think that work experience can really help a young person decide what their route into a career might be Oh, definitely. It, it's a it's a huge part of um, a, a program at, at college um, and also the experiences at school. I think we can all have a perception about what a particular job is like and what an environment is like. And so work experience is an opportunity to test that out. Um, even if you want to work in a particular sector, it's very different from one employer to another. So understanding the type of environment that you, you like to work in, looking around and discovering jobs. You take, for example, for me, I said I was an opportunist. I think work experience exposes you to all sorts of different jobs that you may not have even heard about before. Um, so it's a way of broadening your horizons to, to get much more exposure to the different types of jobs that there are. And there's also the uh, opportunity through that work experience to gain um, and put your skills to the test so that when you're writing a UCAS application or when you're writing an application for, for another job or to go on to another course, you've got that experience to call on. Um, and in interviews, when, when an employer says, can you give me a time when, that work experience is the opportunity for, for you to have those to enable you to showcase what you're able to, to do, um, either to a, a higher education uh, institution or for, for a job. Fantastic, thank you. And we just had a question coming from one of our students here um, and they asked, um, is an apprenticeship or an internship better? Oh gosh, then that, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I think that um, it would depend, that's such a broad question because it would depend what industry you want to go in. So um, there are some industries where internships are much more prevalent than apprenticeships. So there, that, that would be something to, uh, to throw back at that. Um, and then I also it, it comes down to um, if you want to study to gain formal recognition for qualifications for a particular occupation, then that's what an apprenticeship is designed to do. It's designed to give you not only work experience, but you're working towards qualifying in a particular in, in a particular discipline. So I don't think it's an either or. I think it very much depends on the, the sector that you want to, to work in, what opportunities there are, whether they whether it's internship or apprenticeship, and ultimately what do you want from it? Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, I, I believe I should be very grateful for that answer. <laughs> um, and, and Mark, just coming back to you, if that's OK, and based on your experience, are there any other pathways or, or kind of routes into employment that you would want to highlight or talk about this evening? You're muted, Mark. There we go. There we go. Um, we did press our mute bit. Obviously, you didn't want to do it the first time around. Um, I, I, I think it's evident that there's there's different routes in to employment. Um, you know, I actually spent six months unemployed before I went into work after dropping out um, from from Polytechnic. So having having the apprenticeship that there's there's a range I mean there's traineeships which are also routes into apprenticeships as well uh, routes into employment sorry um, you know traineeships are a shorter program they're fixed on a particular sector it's not so qualification driven um, at the start and it's a shorter duration you know so typically they range from sort of 12 weeks up to six months but they can be a bit longer um, and that's for people who really do just want to get into the world of work and start working. And from then you can convert to an apprenticeship um, as well. I mean, there are T levels, which are the new new routes that, that Paul referred to. These are new technical qualifications. They're sort of the equivalent of um, really doing an A level, but from a technical perspective. So so not following the academic route, which typically normally would you'd go to university from. Um, T levels you can use and move on to university, but again, there is an expectation that you'd move on to higher level apprenticeships after completing a, tech, completing a technical level. And they're working with 
large employers. Uh, what's crucial to that is an industry placement. You spend around about 45 to 50 days working on a specified project, which is assessed whilst you're in that workplace. And again, it's a very good way of experiencing different sort of uh, disciplines, if you like, within the employer that you're placed with. So um, it is another routine. Uh, obviously, you're not paid. Um, it is more traditional in terms of your spending time at a college or a provider doing all the theory and background work. So it's almost a hybrid between um, an apprenticeship and university in a way. It's, it's that entry route in. But if you're still more content with wanting to study more, then perhaps the T-level is a route um, into both apprenticeships and also university after that time. So there are lots of different ways of, of going. So don't sort of feel that you have to make your mind up straight away. Um, because you know you, you may start on one route, decide that's not the right way for you, and another opportunity comes up elsewhere. Fantastic, thank you. And I'd just like to take a few minutes as well to kind of reflect on the, the skills and experiences that could help young people in their chosen pathway, regardless of what that is. And I think resilience is something that comes up from our audiences quite a lot in terms of overcoming obstacles or challenges. And do you have any words for, of advice there at all, Mark? Um, it's it's tough out there and it's tough for young people, particularly at the moment, you know, with with, you know, there's increasing numbers of young people where the impact of COVID is adversely affecting um, young people and employment opportunities. So it's going to be hard, um, you know, let's be honest about it. Um, and again, this comes back to the perseverance side of things and in life you will get knockbacks. Um, you get knockbacks every day in life and it's the ability to pick yourself up and, and dust yourself down and carry on again. Um, because you get knocked back on that particular day doesn't mean to say that the following day you're going to get knocked back again. So it, it is a question of, of continuing to, to keep going um, as hard as that can be sometimes. There's, all day, there's always days when some of us don't feel like doing that. Um, and you have to just get on with it there's there's no there's no quick and easy answer unfortunately um life isn't that straightforward or that simple um but it is about relying on your friends relying on your networks your, your colleagues the people that you work with the people that you socialize with um you know because you won't be alone in those experiences they also will be going through similar experiences and so sharing um, what's happening is important um, talking to people about what's happening is important because the people you speak to might have other contacts um, and they might then be able to put you in contact and, and get you on that road to success again so it is it's it's a hard road but it can be achieved and you just have to persevere and keep going for it that's fantastic thank you and i'd like to come to julie next if that's okay Julie, just we've obviously spoken about the, the, the numerous different routes and pathways that young people uh, might choose to, to start their career, but I'd be really interested in any insights you could share with our audience on what skills, experiences or things that might help our audience stand out in any applications they make, regardless if that's for university, for work experience, for an apprenticeship or a traineeship, what would really help them to stand out amongst the crowd, I guess? You're just muted, Julie. We'll come back to you shortly if that's OK. So Anna, yeah. to throw, oh, you're here now. No, Julie, you're muted again. There we go. Um, I would say that employability skills will make you stand out from the crowd. Um, now, the one way, because we don't know what sort of careers a lot of you will be, will be doing as you get older, what you'll be applying for, because we don't really know what the landscape of jobs are. Many jobs haven't been invented yet, but a way to future proof your careers is to develop the soft skills. So skills are important, for instance, like your communication skills. You know, these are key skills, being a good listener, you're able to show to somebody that you're interested, being passionate, interested, and if you're interested, then you'll be interested in um, good body language and being thoughtful of others. You know, all of these things will help you to to stand out. You know, especially when you've got virtual interviews, um, it's very very difficult. But 
if you are interested, if you're interested in, and it's really important, I would say as well, because lots of interviews are going to be um, done virtually. So practice, you know, practice with your friends, see how you come across, critique yourself, but definitely, definitely work on your soft skills. I mean, it's important to have your hard skills, your qualifications and everything else, but for whatever career you're going to be doing to help you to stand out in a crowd, develop your soft skills as well. It's really important in your employability skills. Is that helpful? Very helpful. Thank you so much. And we're just about to wrap up the session here and I'm really keen to end on a fantastic positive for our audience. So Julie, could you tell us in one sentence the thing that you enjoy the most about your job at the moment? Um, inspiring people, you know, I, I, I met somebody who wanted to work in musical theatre and everybody had told her that she needs a contingency, it's not a real job. Well, I, you know, I have um, people in my family that have worked hard and her mum told me that that it, she really, really, she still talks about me that I helped her to be inspired and I took it seriously. So inspiring people, making a difference really, really is the thing that, that I enjoy about my job. That's fantastic, thank you. And Anna, can you let us know what it is that you enjoy the most about your job or what motivates you on a daily basis? Uh, similar to Julie, what motivates me, I think, is being able to make a difference to people's lives every day. Um, every day we get feedback from customers, um, whether it's students, parents, employers, um, that they've found the, the ideas that we've created really useful and that it's helped them. Um, and I think that really motivates me every day. That and the fact that no two days are the same. So such variety in work at the moment, whether it's uh, talking on conferences like this evening, speaking to people in South Africa or India or, you know, all sorts of really interesting stuff at the moment. So that also motivates me. Fantastic, thank you. And Rasheen, what is it about your job that you really enjoy the most? Uh, yeah, same as the other panellists, helping <laughs> young people, but also I think for me it's um, our graduates. So I work with a group of graduates who are from a similar background to you guys who are out there who are thinking about going to university, for example, and actually seeing them graduate. So seeing their journey, letting them get to the end of it and being a part of that. So yeah, that's probably the best part for me. That's great, thank you. And Verity, coming on to you, are you also passionate about your job and the impact you can have for young people? Yeah, absolutely. So I was asked this question yesterday um, and without a doubt the best thing about my role is, is being able to see people change and develop in such a short space of time with the opportunities that we give them. Um, people seem to really find themselves at work and their confidence builds really fast, really quickly. So if you're feeling nervous about the work world at the moment, please don't. I guarantee I've met people less confident than you who are now in manager positions and, and doing incredibly well with, with their jobs. That's a fantastic advice. Thank you so much, Verity. And Mark, your closing comments, what is it that you enjoy the most? Uh, I re repeat what everybody said. Um, definitely variety and, and actually that variety continues to challenge you. So you get new opportunities. So again, you, you're always moving forward. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, it's working with the young people that we do who come into us and think there aren't opportunities for them. And by the end of the time, they're leaving us and they're moving on to employment or apprenticeships and they take their first steps into the world of work and becoming independent is, is really rewarding. That's fantastic, thank you. And last but not least, Tracy, do you have any final words of wisdom or advice for our audience? Well, I think uh, words of wisdom and advice, that's always very difficult, isn't it? Um, I, I would say, um, it's a bit, so it's been said before, don't think that you have got one decision and then that's it. Recognise that your working life is going to be a, a, a long time. Uh, and so it's okay to try things it's OK to try something and decide that you don't like it and the world is not going to come to an end if you decide that you don't like it and then you want to make a change. There are lots of people out there who will help you to make a change and help you to understand what the opportunities are. So if, if at first it doesn't seem right, don't always just um, stick with it. Keep going, keep going until you find the thing that really, really lights your fire. 
That's fantastic. What wonderful words to end on. Thank you so much, Tracy. And a huge thank you to the rest of our panelists and, and Paul for joining us this evening. What a fantastic session. Unfortunately, just this does end the three broadcasts that we have been running this week, but all have been recorded and will be distributed to the schools and colleges in the Southeast Midlands area. And they will also be available on the Semla website as well. Have a great evening, everyone, and thank you so much for being with us. Bye, everyone. Bye. <clears throat>